last year specifically trying to get at um, black and Latino kids was to back it up a bit. Kids don't get to 11th grade and say, you know what, I want to take computer science. Like they've already oftentimes been exposed to it. So we're backing up and having a, um, computer science principals starting in this fall computer science principals, several thousand schools are actually going to be introducing gaming and coding at a much earlier time so that kids are prepared and ready um, to show up in college to be physics and chemistry and, and computer science so they can go on to industry and higher ed. So I can speak more about higher ed um, now or I, I, I'll pass it. Um, the affordability question a little more deeply, and it, it, particularly with the really rising cost of higher education and what that means in terms of the options for students, uh, and, and also how, and what that means for HBCUs as well. So the, the issues confronting affordability are at various different levels. We give the largest scholarships available. We give scholarships in high school, in undergraduate, and to community college students who want to go to four-year institutions. We give the largest scholarships available, and we give the most number. But we can only reach 1,000 kids total. And we have $650 million. We are by far and away the largest scholarship foundation in the country. Yet the, the problems uh, that, that uh, Dr. Hall alluded to are spot on. And one is backsliding. If you are a third grader and you um, are a low income kid and you test advanced, by the time you're an eighth grader, the likelihood is you're no longer going to test advanced. And it's a 0.6 likelihood. OK, now flip it around. If you're a wealthy kid and in third grade you test dummy, by the time you get to eighth grade, there's a 0.6 likelihood that you're going to test advanced. It's completely the antithesis of the American dream. It is not what America is about. The backsliding is awful. Something that the College Board has done, which I think is kind of wonderful, is they've got this deal with Khan Academy where they send, and where the Khan Academy folks do test prep online. Well, if you're a wealthy kid, you can put you, you can take the test five times and you only submit your top scores. If you're a poor kid, you get to take it once or at most twice and you're stuck with whatever score you get. And that's, for the wealthy kid, it's after a Kaplan course. And the Kaplan Premier course today is $6,000. Now, what, what poor kid has that kind of money? It's completely unfair. And to the College Board's credit, they've begun to address that. And it's free. And, and it is free. I, I, you know, I wish that there were equivalent, you know, doing it online, you've got to have discipline. Doing it with a tutor who comes to your home for three months, for three hours a day, that's a whole different kettle of fish. So on the one hand, it's a great stride. On the other hand, it's still worrisome. Final point, um, high-performing, low-income kids struggle. And they struggle once they get to college. Because it's not just, I mean, one thing that I've been very impressed by is the difficulties that these kids have overcome. But they're unlikely difficulties. Some are homeless, home insecure. Some are food insecure. Some are LGBTQ. Some are undocumented. And the worst combination is when they're all of the above or some of the above, right? A black kid who's gay and is struggling with a conservative religious family 
and gets thrown out of the house. And that we've seen too. We have a kid who has two 800 board scores and classical violinist came out to his father as gay and he threw him out of the house. And the kid writes in the essay, I didn't know what, I, I walked on a bridge and I didn't know what I was gonna do. Okay? Extraordinary moment. And fortunately he got our scholarship and he's gonna go to a first rate college. But do you think that's the kind of support we were talking about earlier from the home? Shocking. Shocking. And that's the story, the kind of story, that every one of our kids has. And particularly, I mean, my heart goes out when I see the African American kids or the Hispanic kids, and they're struggling not only with who they are in school, but poverty on top of that. How do you get through that? I couldn't do it. No chance. And yet these kids somehow overcome those barriers and perform at a high level. Final point, if these kids get into the highly selective schools, they perform better, better than the kids from the wealthy end. Why is that? because the support that they get from those schools raises them up, gives them the support. There's this concept called the imposter syndrome where you get, you get one bad grade and you say, I, didn't, I, I shouldn't be here, I don't belong here. Well, it's at that moment that somebody needs to say to you, stupid test, badly graded, you didn't get the right instruction. You'll study differently next time. But to get the confidence that you can do it at that moment is critical because otherwise the kids drop out. And then that's permanent loss. The cost of education has risen along with the cost of the cost of education has risen, along with the cost of everything else. Uh, the, for, the, for the low income student, what they are faced with is $5,500 a year in Pell Grant funds. That's what, that's what the Pell Grant is, which means they can get $2,500 roughly per semester. Uh, at the most inexpensive institutions, right. that may cover tuition. At most institutions, that would only be a fraction of your semester's tuition. That, is, that does not cover uh, the cost of living if you live off campus or if you lived on campus, uh, room and board, books, and so forth. Those uh, items are usually covered by uh, subsidized or unsubsidized student loans. A student is, uh, a low income student is, is qualified for, uh, in the absence of a scholarship or something to supplement or some parental supplemental or some other supplement, uh, roughly another $10,000 for the entire academic year. Um, so on the average, a low income student will be able to get uh, $2,500 in Pell Grant plus $5,000 uh, every semester, about $7,500, okay? Uh, that does not cover their cost. Then, um, uh, students, uh, there's the Parent PLUS uh, loan that we had such a controversy about over a year ago because uh, the standards were changed for Parent PLUS. What Parent PLUS is, if a student is trying to go to a high-end institution uh, that has a high tuition, uh, that parents would be able to go and borrow money uh, 
uh, through a federally subsidized program through the uh, Department of Education to help the student pay the cost of, uh, of tuition. Because first you got to have parents. I need not talk about the, the situation that we have of single parent uh, and sometimes no parent households of young people. I'm talking about the ordinary person among the masses. Uh, we have a real problem uh, that these young people are facing. Uh, so, but assuming they have parents, uh, the Parent PLUS debacle was that the Department of Education changed the regulations and made the credit standards uh, so tight that if a person had the slightest credit blemish at all, because that wiped out the black parents, and so uh, large numbers of black students had to drop out of Howard and Tuskegee and Hampton and Xavier. Uh, and so it has been improved, but it has not been corrected. So you have the problem of, of inability to get loans above uh, $15,000 a year uh, with tuition exceeding that you have students who are having to borrow because they have no money otherwise, uh, and then graduating from college, uh, many times unable to find a job, sometimes because of racial discrimination, uh, and uh, unable to pay uh, the student loan. And from, a, from the institution's perspective, if you're an HBCU, uh, they are breathing down, the Department of Education is breathing down your neck about uh, what they call cohort default rate. Uh, uh, and threatening to, uh, to uh, uh, kick the institution out of the program for being able to provide financial aid to students if the students do not graduate uh, and then pay the money back uh, at a certain rate. So th the, the problems are severe. I'll be very, very brief as it pertains to affordability. One, uh, affordability is a partnership, right? The federal government, the state government, institutions and students and families. Uh, and until we get the right balance back to where it was at one point, state governments has, have cut um, funding for public institutions tremendously. Um, so until we get that back, oftentimes in state budgets, of course, they have to be balanced. You talk about education as a spend. I always say once you've talked about education as a spend, you've already lost. It's an investment. Right? Myself, a Pell Grant recipient, I'm sure I've paid <coughs> back the dividends of my Pell Grant many times over. And second, um, briefly, we have to also worry about decision making for students. We talked about counselors. Let's be honest, oftentimes kids should probably go to their state public institutions um, if they're financially strapped. Because you go out of state, you go to a school where you don't finish, now you have a higher debt load potentially, if, unless you have a scholarship or the institution met your, uh, your unmet need. Many students need to look back at their in-state schools um, and stay away from schools that are not serving uh, students well. I want to make sure we have time for the room to ask questions, uh, <coughs> especially since we didn't get a question time from the audience after the first panel. So why don't I, I think what I'll do is I'll gather a couple of questions and then and then you guys can answer which ones you want. Yeah, and there's a mic here. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Carrie Lee Riley. Um, my question deals with uh, African Americans and people of color as professors and instructors and educators. Um, this is an issue that I don't see anyone addressing. Uh, I was a professor at a community college and I was denied tenure uh, based on institutional racism. And there was no place for me to go or to seek support or to get uh, legal aid. Um, and you know, subsequently I found out the, the president of the college actually called uh, the um, campus police uh, and to ask them to place a student in my class to spy on me. 
and give information back to the school. Uh, asked the police to do a background check on me to find something in my past that she could use to get rid of me. And I had no place to go. So, I mean, the, and I was a mentor for many of the uh, African American men, mostly athletes, who came into the college and they said they have no voice once I was pushed out. So, anyone know anything about the, the African Americans in professors, teachers, support? Okay. Can we get just one more? Yeah, Jamila Rashid, I'm the executive director of the Urban Health Program at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where actually the Amanda Lewis that you mentioned also works. And um, I'm wondering if any of you uh, can talk maybe about uh, programs such as mine. We're a pipeline program from K through graduate school. So we start with kids in kindergarten, bring them in in the summer, give them extra academic uh, learning, and we also bring them in during the, um, the weekends from about fourth grade through high school, and then we have a program for undergraduate students, and then for uh, students who are going into careers in medicine, dentistry, nursing, and so forth. Our program, was, is supported by our state legislature. And it was created because former <laughs> graduates of the university went to the state legislature <coughs> and made a, a case that the state needed to fu fund the program to provide this kind of support for African American, Hispanic, Latino, and Native American students. And I don't know if you have, uh, in any of your research or your experience, dealt with programs like that, but we, uh, we, gra we have graduated the third largest number, and we're not a, a HBCU, in careers in health sciences. Over 6,000 students since the program was created. And I think there's a need for more programs like that, not just for careers in the health sciences, but in general, uh, so that students, and, and the parents are required to participate in the program, especially at the uh, early age, early grades, and we have no problems getting them do that, to do that, but you have to catch them early. And so, you know, I, I don't know the extent to which that is going on in other places, but I know the value of the program. So, you know, thank you. So it would be good to hear your reflections on both pipeline programs that connect colleges to pre-K pre to 12 and what that does for either accessibility or being able to afford school and the issue that the professor raised about uh, the sort of institutional racism that that it's affecting not only students in some institutions, but also the people who are leading the classrooms, who are advising and counseling. I'll just say briefly, it's the same pipeline. That pipeline that we're starting in third or fourth grade, the pipeline to the professorship is the same thing. We oftentimes hear, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, and there unfortunately aren't too many of us at decision-making tables, so that they can deny you tenure because there was no one there to stand up for you. I worked at one point at the University of Maryland with one of the associate provosts, and he specifically looked at hiring amongst uh, faculty of color, and of course there was a higher bar. Faculty of color came from more elite, more prestigious institutions <coughs> compared to their white colleagues, and that was just the reality of it. Um, you hear about search committees on, on college campuses. Well, we can't find any black engineers. Well, did you go to Nesby? Right? But because there's nobody at those tables to help push that conversation, it never moves anywhere until you have someone who can help upset uh, some of the structures that we're so used to seeing in, in our institutions. I wish I had a better answer, um, but there are people at individual campuses who are pushing that conversation, and we need those decisions to continue to move forward. Go to an HBCU. <laughs> and I'll just say, as the pipeline programs, other programs are the TRIO and Gear Up type programs that um, provide some of the same wraparound and support services as we see Kim coming to the mic. See, see, Wendell, you stole my thunder. Oh, sorry. But, but please, <laughs> Just to address um, the pipeline question, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, there are the federal TRIO programs, and one of them in particular deals specifically with getting students of color, uh, underrepresented students financially, and first generation of college students into professorial positions. It doesn't really address the gentleman's concern 
concern about um, sort of the process of his institution, but it starts looking for kids who are at least juniors in college, and again, they're low income, first generation of college, and people of color, and it was precisely started, it was 30 years old this year, mm -hmm. it was started because there were not enough uh, people who look like the folks in this room at that level where they were getting ready to dictate what the scholarship was. And so this year coming up, for those who are interested, is the next, it's a secular grant competition, right? And so this year is the next grant competition. So if you want to bring a program like that to your campus, be following it. I have cards. I'm happy to share information with anybody who's interested. But it's a wonderful program. And we produced many, many faculty of color. And I used to actually work for the Rodney E. McNair program. There we go. Are there other questions? Well, I have one more if we're, uh, if there's time for it. Oh, there is another. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Mm. <laughs> that happens sometimes. Um, hi, I'm a student. Um, I'm a senior at a university in New Jersey. Um, and I'm actually an inspiring teacher. And I just wanted to know a little bit more of the institutional racism that you guys were mentioning that'll appear in um, elementary school. Because I know you were saying that like middle class students um, who are black and white, at first they start out the same, but then they get separated somewhere along the way. Um, and I want to know how that happens, because I, that's a section that um, that's a subject that I'm very passionate about, and that's something that I want to stop. I don't like the stigma that African American students have less opportunities that they can't um, achieve as much as their white counterparts. I hate that stigma so much. So I want to know like how I could change that in any way and what to see in the schools that I'm going to be teaching in so that I can try to like stop that in its tracks and prevent that from happening to any other school, any other student. Great. Thank you. So we can, we can certainly achieve, and we actually do achieve. So I, I hope I didn't leave you with that um, as, a, as a final outcome. So if you think about within schools, we all come to the classroom with our own biases. You know, we're, we're human people. We're human beings. Um, unfortunately, the majority of the teaching force are young white women, which does not in and of itself make them biased solely towards black people or black boys, but oftentimes those experiences to them are foreign. Uh, you've heard the first panel talk about behaviors of young black girls, speaking out, speaking back, um, versus cultivating some of those experiences, it may be seen as threatening. So. When it, when it comes to the academics, not even the discipline, but the academics, um, you have a perceived bias of someone when you first meet them, when you first see them. You may not act upon it, but you do. Way too often in schools, um, teachers are going to assume when they first see you, this kid can do, this kid can't do. They may not act upon it, but then again, they may. So what you see is an accumulation effect where we see the track. I'm sure you've read and heard a lot about academic tracking. Um, oftentimes, the tracking is not based on something that's objective. It's subjective. Well, I think Billy's at the third, in this green reading group, you're in blue and you're in red. That's in third grade. So by the time you get to fourth and fifth grade, you've now had blue reading group types of experiences because Sally talked to Jane and, oh yeah, he's, you know, he was in my blue group. You know, so you have experiences that layer over a year after year after year and now some students become conditioned. And while they had such spark in second and third grade and wanted to learn and wanted to be excited about learning and asking questions and being engaged, it gets dampened. Well, I'm in this blue group again. See it in seventh grade, which now you're starting to talk about a college going curriculum that you should be on, but you've been in the blue group for so long and looking around, I see who's in the blue group. Now you're in ninth grade. Now you're in 10th grade. Hopefully you're still in 10th grade. So there are oftentimes so many experiences that happen early that by the time you get to ninth grade and you talk about who's academically qualified and who's in advanced placement courses and who's not, we're trying to upset some of that. We work with members, we work with schools. So we use some objective measures. I know sometimes we don't like objective measures, but we have something where looking at your PSAT score where we can signal to schools and districts and say, guess what? You have 500 black and brown and Native American kids in your district who scored above a level that we know if they score above that level, they'll do well in AP exams, but they're not in an AP course. Why? Because what 16-year-old needs to go and say, hey, Ms. Jones, I really want to take AP, versus Ms. Jones saying, you know what, you can do it, you need to be in this class. So we're creating, we're working with members to help create maybe opt-out policies, where you're automatically in the advanced course. If you want out, your parents have to call and ask out. Right, so it's creating the conditions 
Um, and oftentimes schools aren't proactive in doing so. And I'll be quiet. So I'll, I'll take a run at that answer as well. Um, and I live in the world of the pragmatic and not the theoretical. So I'll tell you a vignette. Um, I was a sort of gadfly to the school system and one of my friends was Rudy Crew. Um, he was chancellor at the time. And he and I had a conversation and he knew that I was very concerned about the Bronx Sciences and the Stuyvesants of the world. Selective public high schools in New York. Uh, we have to take an exam to get in. And he said, I'm going to solve the problem of not being allowed to, not getting uh, any number of African American kids into the schools. He said, I've got spotters in middle schools and we're going to find the African American kids who can cut it and who can make it in. And we're going to give them test prep for the summer, for six weeks in the summer. And I blurted out, the Asian family is going to give them six years. This has no chance. And it was kind of ballsy of me because he's the school's chancellor. He, you know, has devoted his life to this. So lightning strikes, he has a fight with the mayor, and suddenly I'm school's chancellor. Highly unlikely set of circumstances. Um, and the result, he had 60 kids who were prepped and the result was not one got in. So now it's my turn. You know, big mouth, what are you gonna do? So I built three schools in places where I knew my mother wouldn't allow me to go, right? One in Harlem at City College, high school for math, science, and engineering. One in uh, Bed-Stuy, and one in the Bronx, um, Gilder Lehrman, and actually in a very nice neighborhood in, near Lehman College, but I knew there was no chance. Those schools for 10 years were majority minority, for 10 years. And, um, and Stuyvesant, at the same time, was 1% black. So why the difference? because we relied on racism to get us there. Now, what happened after 10 years? Someone called Claire Hempel wrote a book that was like the Consumer Reports for the New York City school system, and suddenly these schools flipped on a dime. And the Asian parent, the Jewish parent, figured, oh, I can send my kids there. And they became much less minority. I mean, today it's like 15%. But in a system that's 87% minority, that's an embarrassment. But for 10 years, it was the other way around. I put it to you, you have to think creatively, out of the box, and with an angle. No one can give you the answer. What do you do to prevent the backsliding? But you figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our entire uh, esteemed panel. I don't know if you'll be around for a little bit afterwards if there are any questions, but thank you very much. So we're going to end with remarks from Randy Weingartner who's the president of the American Federation of Teachers, which represents, pause and <laughs> You missed the cheers for, for the teachers earlier. Uh, which represents teachers, paraprofessionals, and school-related personnel, higher education faculty and staff, nurses, and other healthcare professionals, local, state, and federal government employees, and early childhood educators. Thank you so much for coming and speaking with us today. district story. No, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> so um, 
I get I have gotten to be the cleanup speaker in three panels today. <laughs> um, so um, let me see if I can. So first, thank you for staying this long. Um, and also, I really want to thank Representative Scott, who is the um, ranking minority um, representative on the Education Committee. And in this Congress, virtually nothing gets done with one exception, education. And he has done, I know this is going into my five minutes, but I'm doing it on purpose. He has done a remarkable job as the ranking minority member to get something done to actually ensure that public education will live on for a few years regardless of who is president of the United States of America. And whether it was the work that he did in kind of um, in, in ensuring that the new bill to create a reset in the um, federal education policy was done, or just this week, the new bill on Perkins, meaning on career tech ed, he has done more in the two years that he has been ranking member than probably anyone with the exception of Ted Kennedy in terms of this work. And I just really want to thank him very much for the work he's done. <laughs> Finding common ground without or with standing on his values and his ground. That's what Representative Scott has done. Now, we're in the middle of a reset. That's what the new ESSA bill gives us. It says that a lot of the things that were done that created a hyper-testing, hyper-focus on math, English, and graduation scores, we need to take a pause. A lot of things are shifting back to the states, but there's a lot of amazing interventions in that bill that if in the right hands and with the right resources could create that shift. But what is it a shift to? And that's what I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on, which is that most of the time we are having a debate about somebody's really stupid idea and why it's wrong, as opposed to our side having a debate on, or, or, or building a consensus on what we need to do to help all kids succeed. So obviously, we need to focus on both excellence and equity. And the equity side hasn't been focused on enough. I'm sure you've talked about it a lot. There's more segregation than ever before, and certainly since the 62 years of Brown versus Board of Education. There's less investment in schools today than there were in 2008. And I can go on and on and on. Something's wrong, but that means we are not winning the argument about what it takes to help all kids to succeed. And I think it starts with, and the Phi Delta Kappen report showed us this, the last one that came out a few weeks ago, that got no press at all. The question, two questions in there that were really remarkable to me. One is, they asked people, what's the purposes of school? And people were every which way because all of those things were the purposes of school. Yes, school is about academics, obviously. We would say that testing and academics are not synonymous, but school is about academics. But school is also about helping kids create a skill set so that they're ready for career. And school is also about helping nurture our democracy. I'm pretty embarrassed that we don't teach civics anymore. And that people would say, don't let the government take away my Medicare or my Social Security, which are government programs. But we don't have, because of testing, 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 and all sorts of other things, schooling is about helping to nurture our democracy and to promote tolerance and to fight bigotry and to fight bullying, not to allow it to be unleashed and then say, oh, woe is me. 
And then schooling is about, as this panel is, not just educating the whole child, but making sure kids feel a sense of themselves and a sense of confidence and a joy about going to school and a love of learning and a love of literacy. All of that is about schooling. Yes, it is about all of the above, not just one, two, or three. But we don't even have a consensus about that. So how are people going to actually say, we're going to pay for all of this, if there's not even a consensus about that? But second, and equally important, we know what works. And in the number of years that I had the honor to work with Harold, not work against Harold when he was chancellor, but work with him. And in the number of years since then, I do actually think it comes down to four concepts. The other side came up with a lot of concepts. Test, sanction, test, more tests, high stakes, individual accountability, and competition. And then on top of it, have a little austerity so that schools or top-down control, so that you could get to schools like Detroit, which are totally and completely abysmal, made much worse after the state takeover. What are the four things? Every school that is successful, whether it's a high poverty school, whether it's a wealthy school, do the following four things. Number one, just like this topic today, they address student well-being. And hopefully it's students and their families' well-being. And there's a ton of different ways you can do that. Whether it's going for more guidance counselors, more nurses, whether it's wraparound services, there are lots of ways. But we have to address where kids are, first and foremost, to get them to where we want them to be. Number two, powerful learning. I don't, project-based learning, all sorts of different learning, but if kids don't feel engaged and they don't want to come to school, I don't care what we do. We need to make that engagement really powerful. And there's lots of different ways to do that. Number three, if you're gonna do one and two, you gotta develop the capacity of your workforce, including your principals first, to do that. And that is harder and harder with the whitening of the teaching force. We must deal with diversity of our teaching force and call out what's been going on and figure out ways of changing that. And not just ask the one black male teacher in a school to do everything. That's a good way of that guy leaving. Give me a break. Number four. We are not, schooling is not a competitive sport. Maybe football teams in schooling are, but not schooling. We have to build on each other. We have to work together. Collaboration is not kumbaya, but there's a lot of ways of doing that. If we actually focused on these four things, student well-being, powerful learning, building capacity of our workforce, and a collaborative model in schools, and found the right strategies and the best practices, and paid for it, then we wouldn't have the kind of stuff that we have right now with Donald Trump proposing a $20 billion voucher scheme which would essentially wipe out all of Title I and everything else. We wouldn't have the situation where charters were destabilizing schools as opposed to being part of a bigger plan, where entities like the, like the NAACP and Black Lives Matter have said put a moratorium on charters so we could actually stem the draining and the destabilization of schools, which by the way, and this is the last point I'll make, the other major finding from PDK was that people don't like that. One of the only things that people have consensus about is that there's not enough money in schools and that we should be fixing, not closing schools. We can do this, but we have to work together to get this done, just like we did under Bobby Scott's leadership to change ESSA, or to change No Child Left Behind to ESSA. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who came. Thank you to you, Randy. Thank you to both of our panels. This has been a remarkable afternoon.